Good morning. How's everybody? Good, good. How are you doing? Doing well. All right. So, um, uh, you know, today's topic um, is all about, you know, contracts and given uh, that every entrepreneur or small business owner at some point will, <laughs> will have to deal with this, right? Um, and you being a former mergers and acquisitions lawyer, um, any words of wisdom to get us started when it comes to contracts? Because I think for a lot of people, it's a scary topic, right? Because when do I need a contract? When do I not? Do I have to hire a lawyer? How do I, you know, what goes into it? All the stuff that we think about. Yeah, thank you. This is just one of the days I get to justify the law degree that I never right? did. Um, so <laughs> thank my parents for all the money they blew. No. Um, no, listen, it's, it's, and get them out. <laughs> right, yeah. exactly, exactly. Um, and no, listen, I mean, I happen to be one of those entrepreneurs that came from a legal background and did mergers and acquisitions. Very, very complicated stuff from very young. So this was an area that was, um, you know, I knew a lot about, but for many of us, you know, it's hard. It's a very difficult area um, because, you know, there's a whole bunch of different resources that are out there that run the gamut from, you know, a, a SaaS platform, like it'd be interesting to learn more about all the way up to, you know, hiring lawyers. So I'm going to try to address um, some basics of some legal mumbo jumbo um, and also uh, just some of the resources that are out there and different types of resources that are out there um, as well as some free ones that are available more and more these days. So um, I think Victoria, more so than anything, it is a little bit of a scary area. Mm -hmm. um, you know, somebody says, Hey, well, somebody just bought cupcakes for me from whoever. Do I need a contract? <laughs> right. right? Uh, all the way up to, um, the experience we've all had of, you know, I, wow, I just struck a deal with big corporate company for, to sell them $10,000 worth of stuff. And they sent me a 10,000 page agreement to sign, to sell. And they told me that I have to have 20 people on my information technology security staff just to sell them. So this is not as linear as just, Hey, I need a legal agreement. Um, and it runs the gamut. So I'm going to, I want to, I want people um, to chime in, especially if they have basic questions about, you know, just basic legal concepts, basic legal agreements, let's chime in. Okay. That's a great point. I was just going to say folks who really want this to be interactive. And so, um, you know, for everybody here, we do have a, you know, smaller than usual group. So use this opportunity to really get into your specific questions as it relates to your business. Um, and of course, Michael, like you were just saying, right. Because for obviously for a serial entrepreneur like Robert, <laughs> this might be all news, but for I think a lot of folks here, it's right because you have not only vendor agreements, but you have employee agreements, you have, you know, basically any area of your business, um, yep. you want to be sure that you're covered and, you know, understand where you do or don't need one is important. Absolutely. And everybody should remember that within the learning community that you all have access to, um, you know, there's a whole section called legal, which lays out a lot of this, a lot of this stuff. So don't forget to take advantage of that. Um, so let me start with the basics. I'm going to start with kind of early stage company stuff, right? So if you think about forming a company, um, you know, the first thing that you're doing in a lot of cases is trying to decide, okay, what kind of company to form? Where do I form it? And how do I form it? So there are a couple of different company types and there's a very extensive learning module on this in the learning community under legal. It's also up under setting up your business to get started. And that is kind of your um, LLC versus what they call a C corp, which is just, or a basic corporation, as well as some other, some other types. Um, when you're forming, when you're choosing, you know, whether to form one or the other, first of all, us and others, there are many, many people that can guide you. Okay. Um, so don't feel like you have to go at this alone. Um, I think some of the main reasons why people form LLCs versus forming a, a corporation or what they call a C corporation is tax. And what I mean by that is if you form a regular schedule, I'm sorry, if you form a C corp, a regular corporation, what happens is the corporation gets taxed on its income. And then when money is distributed, to like say, say shareholders, investors, then the shareholders also get taxed as income. Okay. Well, that doesn't work great for an early stage company a lot of times. Right. Um, and that's why they have things that are like, like limited liability companies or LLCs that they call pass throughs, meaning that because you're basically the owners of the business, the 
the profits, if you will, quote unquote, pass through to the owner. So they don't tax it at the entity, right? They don't tax the LLC. They just pass through to the individuals, okay? That is by far the most common reason that people are do, doing LLCs. Um, you, can, you can certainly um, govern the same way, and there's a little different mechanisms, but you can basically govern the same way and make decisions the same way. That's really the, the major um, the major difference between the two. Um, the other thing I should mention, not to add another level of complexity, is there is this thing called an S corp. And an S corp is, it's a regular corporation where you do a special election called an S corp election, where you elect to have your, your regular corporation treated like a pass-through, like the LLC. Okay, I don't wanna to spend too, too much time because I don't wanna confuse people, but um, needless to say, early stage companies more and more are are being treated or, or being formed as LLCs. The other thing that maybe I should have even started with is do I need a company, right? I'm a consultant and I'm doing things on my own. Um, like, do I, have, do I need it? Um, if you're starting to move any significant amount of dollars through this, then yes, you should form a company. It's not that expensive to do. I'm gonna share with you some of the services that do it. You can do it very easily online for a couple of hundred dollars. The main reason, not the only reason, but the main reason is liability. If you're going out and you're selling cookies, right? And you're doing it on your own and there's a problem, they can sue you personally, okay? If you have a company, they go after the company. Now, you're the company at that point, I understand, but it's just another level of protection where something like your house would not be on the line because it's really the company. So that's, once you get serious, you should form a company it's not particularly not particularly difficult to do. Okay. Um, I know there's a question that came up from, I'm going to pronounce your name right, so correct me, Vipula. Is that right? Yes, that is correct, Michael. Oh. Thank you. And where, oh, my pleasure. Where are you? Uh, I'm based out of Atlanta. Gotcha. And I have a medical device uh, company. Sorry to uh, come in late to the call. I, pre I apologize for that. Um, but it's a, it's a C-Corp uh, formed in Delaware, and it's a medical device company where we are raising our uh, Series A right now um, for our investors. And we had one investor, uh, and the rest is my money. So we are looking forward to getting our Series A done this year. Gotcha. Are you, and, and you're currently a C-Corp or currently an LLC? Uh, we are C-Corp right now. The reason gotcha. for forming, I, I was actually, you know, in the dilemma of doing LLC or C-Corp. We just formed that C-Corp last year because a lot of investors didn't feel comfortable investing in LLC. Right, exactly. It's getting more common, but a lot of especially institutional investors want to invest in a, in a regular corporation. Yeah, we had the same experience. Uh, we formed a C-Corp because of the same reason. Yep. Uh, and are you looking now to, to switch or you're just kind of asking the question about how difficult it is? No, I was just asking a question because uh, like you said, um, we may have one investor that may come in uh, with, or we may have a licensing deal with a company out in Germany. So if that happens, um, would it make sense to leave it C-Corp uh, because of the tax purposes, like you just mentioned, or, you know, how, how do we go about, because there's obviously a lot of uh, filing and regulations with the C-Corp versus LLC. Um, that's where I was going with. Yeah, I think... I think that once you're far enough along that you're raising Series A, you're going to have a, a, a tax strategy for managing anyway. And, and if you're in the medical device arena, um, you're probably reinvesting a lot of dollars. You're going to probably lose money for a little bit. So I don't think, I don't think moving it just so, you know, when you have multiple investors, especially Series A investors, it's not going to be so much about the losses coming to you. Yeah as it would be early on where, you know, you put in $200,000, you lose 150, you want to take those losses. It's, it's just when you're further along, like where you are. Mm -hmm. um, and we, as you know, we, we raised series C actually a couple different, a mile company and it was, it worked better as a C Corp. Yeah. Yeah. So I would, I would stay there. So. Thank you. Cool. Cool. Um, yeah. So I think that, you know, those are the, those are the very basics. I think that when it comes to uh, running a company, which I don't want to skip over, um, remember when you form a company, there are then mechanisms for running things, okay? In a C-Corp, it's a board of directors, 
that elects officers, president, vice president, you know, head of this, head of that. And the shareholders elect the board of directors. So every year shareholders vote, they elect directors and directors then ultimately uh, appoint the officers. Uh, and especially um, in your situation, the composition of the board of directors is really important. Mm -hmm. right? Because if you have a bunch of series A investors coming in, you want to try to the best you can maintain majority of the board of directors because that's who elects the officers, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. including you yeah. if you're president. <laughs> yeah. um, so again, in, a, in an LLC, um, the basics of that are what's called an operating agreement. And an operating agreement is um, the things that dictate um, the, uh, you know, who's going to run what, who's going to do what, basic all the basic operations of, a, of an organization. Um, and that's where you can appoint officers and, and you can have things like managing members is a term, you know, because sometimes there's members of, a, of an LLC. Okay, so when you form a company, you've got then the whole thing about what I'm describing, which sometimes they call governance right, who governs the company, these are the mechanisms that work. And especially as you get further along, and it's not just you, they become really important. Um, another type of agreement that often happens and, and more often than not uh, doesn't happen is a founder's agreement, right? And so a founder's agreement essentially says uh, between two founders or maybe more, um, here's how we're gonna work together. Here's how all this stuff is gonna work, right? Um, we're going to form a company, we're going to have this much equity ownership. And when we have that equity ownership, here's how we're going to run it. I'm going to make these decisions, you're going to make that decision. Now, once you form a company, a lot of those things that are described in a founder's agreement are put into the things that I mentioned, the operating agreement and the other types of things. Um, but especially if you haven't formed a company and you're doing something of significance, um, this is a good document to have. It's gonna lay out who's putting in what, who's dedicating what time, who's um, responsible for what decision-making and very much, very much worthwhile. Okay. Um, that's your kind of basic, basic company stuff, right? Um, oversimplified. In terms of forming companies, virtually every online legal service, right? Legal Zoom, my corporation, you know, the list goes on, makes it pretty seamless to set up a company. They will, these days, unlike back in the past where you may have had to hire a lawyer, um, they will guide you through, they will ask you basic questions. And sometimes um, you can even ask, answer questions online and they answer questions online and they automatically create these documents for you and send them to you. And then you're, you pay a little bit of money and you're, and you're good to go. Okay, so uh, take a look at that, um, those types of companies. There's an asset in the learning community about different types of online companies, but LegalZoom, my corporation, um, and, and a bunch of others that help you, help you do that. And they'll, and they'll walk you through it. And of course, we're happy to walk you through it, um, walk you through it as well. Okay, um, one concept I want people to understand is people say, well, wait a minute, what, what state should I form in? For the most part, um, you should form in a state where, where you are, okay? Um, if you don't form in the state where you are, um, which oftentimes people do in the state of Delaware, because Delaware has some very advantageous laws and rules for this stuff, then you have to qualify to do business in the state where you are. And again, these online services can do this for you. It's a simple page form that basically says, hey, I'm not registered here, but I, uh, I want to qualify to do business here because this is where I'm basically going to do business. Okay, so any state where you have a significant amount of business, you have to qualify to do business. Now, many services are delivered through the internet, you know, like the SaaS platform we talked about before. So there's a lot of debate about where you have to qualify or don't acquire, uh, qualify. But for the most part, if you're doing a broad-based internet service, unless you have an office somewhere or lots of employees somewhere, you don't have to qualify to do business. Um, but that's, again, another simple form that's called qualified to do business. It is oftentimes also called, and this is a really silly name, a foreign certificate. Foreign meaning you're not from this state. It doesn't mean you're not from a country. It means you're not from this state. So if you form in Delaware, 
you might go to New York and say, hey, I want to qualify to do business. And they call it a foreign certificate or foreign qualification. <laughs> Just kind of a kind of a silly name. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, any questions? Let me stop with that one. Yeah. <laughs> any questions on what Michael has been sharing with us? Um, please feel free to raise your hand, chime in. Cool. Okay, Michael, I know um, Valoria had a question. Um, what about subcontracting as a HUB slash minority owned business, um, structuring and initial steps? Are there resources in the learning community? Yeah, so there's a couple things here. One is there are some resources in the community we can direct them to. Your first is qualifying, mm -hmm. right? Do you qualify? Um, are you 51% women or minority owned? Um, that's a pretty stringent requirement. Um, once you're that, then you can subcontract. It's, um, but you can't be a non-minority owned business and subcontract to a minority owned business. The primary contract, if you will, has to be women or minority owned, which generally means 51% uh, actual equity ownership. Um, but happy to talk to you more about that online. There are many, many, many resources and opportunities available out there right now for women and minority owned businesses where lots of uh, companies are trying to proactively buy more from their you know women and minority owned suppliers um so lots of opportunities around that in fact uh the lonely entrepreneur in our platform we're going to be starting to uh later this year bring a lot of those opportunities into the platform so everyone can see them there okay um the one final point that i'll make about um forming a company the governance you know the rules about who makes decisions and is incredibly important. When anybody starts a venture um, with another person, especially a co-founder, in the beginning, um, everything is rosy because you know there's excitement as there should be. You just wanna define things. You wanna define who's contributing what, you wanna define um, who's spending what time, and you wanna define how decisions get made, okay? And if there's, the, a, um, there's two of you, and you say, well, listen, we're going to be unanimous on every decision. You want to build in a mechanism for a third party to help if you, if you need somebody to break a tie. Right. So pick somebody, pick somebody who you trust, who, whose judgment you would pay attention to, who said in these particular circumstances, right, um, the three of us are going to vote on something. Again, I don't mean to be flipped that this is, this is all the easiest stuff in the world, but you do want to define these things. Too many times people stop seeing eye to eye. And later on, it just becomes a little more challenging to, to overcome. Okay, so that's that's forming company stuff. Um, well, let me talk. I'm sorry. Go ahead. Oh, just a, a quick question. Um, so, what what do you think about a situation where, um, you know, there's a decision ahead of time in terms of, you know, I will acquiesce to Mike to you know if we get to a point where we disagree about how we're going to take the business or do you think it's better to you know have a third party to come in the third party um should be pretty rare right two co-founders should really be collaborating on a lot of stuff together and, and nine out of ten of those even more than nine out of ten should be pretty straightforward they might agree to disagree right but they've you've got to be able to work together to to, to move forward because you know obviously things are always changing in an early stage company um, sometimes you will say, this founder is going to make decisions on these issues. This founder is going to make decisions on those issues, but that's pretty rare. Most of the time people are working together, right? And you want to be able to work together to be able to, to do things, especially when you disagree. It's part of the process. The only time you would bring in a third party, if it was really kind of serious stuff, or if you guys are saying, listen, if, if we just can't agree on something, and I'm not talking about the color of the pencils, I'm talking about you know, should we raise money? Like big, big, should we sell the company? Then you can just create a mechanism that says, hey, if each of the founders, if the founders can't agree, they'll basically raise their hand and you have a third party. And I'm not talking about some big formal procedure, right? You're just talking about a, a consultant, you know, a, a business person, you know, but it should definitely be the exception. Thank you. Of course. Um, let's go on to some employee stuff, okay? So, couple of different things you know there are you know right now there's two basic designations of somebody that might work for you they're a, a, an employee which is oftentimes called a w-2 which is just the u.s tax designation 
um, or they are an independent contractor or what you'll sometimes hear called a 1099, which is again, named by the tax form that's filed. Um, when it comes to W-2 employees, um, payroll taxes are withheld, social security taxes are withheld, FICA taxes are withheld. And in a 1099, you basically just pay them and, and it's their responsibility, right? As an independent contractor to take care of all the tax stuff in most, in most cases. Um, the differences between the two are, you know, when you when somebody becomes an employee, in most states, um, you don't have to have an employment agreement with them. Um, you can, uh, but especially in early stage companies, as, except for you know really senior people, you're going to have you're not going to have an employment agreement. You're just going to have you might have an offer letter, right? Um, and that offer letter will say, hey, this is going to be your role, and this is going to be your compensation. These will be your benefits. Um, uh, and that offer letter is fine. Um, keep in mind though, that in almost all states, except for California, everybody is considered what they call an employee at will, which basically means that an organization, you can let go of that employee at any time. Okay. Um, it's pretty common to give a couple weeks notice and things like that, but, but when you sign an offer letter or an employee signs an offer letter, um, they are still an employee will, and unless you sign a separate employment contract, um, that employee can be let go at any time, okay? Um, customary to give some notice. However, nobody can ever discriminate. Nobody ever can hire, fire based on race, gender, or all those things. But um, subject to that, of course, in all these circumstances I'm gonna mention, um, when it comes to people that are just signing offer levers, their employees at will, except in California where they treat you like you have an employment contract, okay? An employment contract is when you actually sign a contract that says, here's what you're gonna do, here's how you could get hired, here's how you get fired, here's how your compensation works. It's a formalized contractual relationship that now governs that relationship with the employee. They're not just an employee at will anymore. They're governed by the terms of that, of that contract, okay? Um, then you have your independent contractors. Independent contractors um, historically were you're, you're hiring them for a particular project, you're hiring them for a particular job, you're hiring them for half their time. Um, and that's just done by an independent contractors agreement. Okay, and we've got examples of these agreements in the learning community as well. Um, uh, now, sometimes more and more people are hiring people as independent contractors in full-time roles. And there's a lot of legal battles going on throughout the United States about whether those people should be treated as employees because there's just different rights and benefits of doing that. Okay, but put that aside for a second. There's big lawsuits in California where um, the states are trying to treat Uber drivers as employees and not independent contractors. And so don't have to worry too, too much about that yet. Um, but suffice it to say, if you wanna hire somebody as an independent contractor, you sign an independent contractor agreement, which says you're gonna, um, you're gonna go ahead and uh, hire them for this role, for this number of hours and the like. Yeah, okay. and as Chris mentioned here, you need an independent contract agreement with an IC in the case of audit, especially in California, so. Yeah. Yep, so, um, you know, this will continue to evolve as a legal area but I want everybody first and foremost, just to understand that there's these two types of relationships with, you know, with individuals um, that, you know, and this is, you know, this is how it largely works and this will continue to, uh, to evolve, okay? Um, and like I said, you know, California, when it comes to being an employee at will, they treat you um, as if you have an employment contract. So you have all these rules about whether you can let people go the same type of perspective is evolving in this area around independent contractors, where most people are, it's really hard to set people up as independent contractors, especially if you're, if they're working for you a good part of the time. Okay. Um, so, but a lot of times people think that when they sign an offer letter, that means you have a contract and you can't be let go. That's not the case. Okay. In, in most places other than, other than California. Okay. Now there's a whole bunch of other implications. There's, you know, employee culture and company culture and, you know, just all that stuff that goes with, you know, hiring and firing people, but just suffice it to say from a legal perspective, 
right? That's just one of the things that you should that you should keep in mind. Okay. Great. Um, a couple other basic things that are set up oftentimes is is advisors or advisory boards. Um, great to have an advisory board agreement, right? We have one. Happy to share. Um, very very simple. This is what you're going to do. This is kind of the compensation you're going to get, if any, right? Could be money, could be in many cases, it's a little bit of equity. Um, and uh, great to set those up and make it a little bit more formal. Um, those agreements are not complicated. There are a couple pages and they're, they're usually very, very simple and they only lay out, um, you know, kind of the stuff that I just, I just laid out. Okay. Great. Um, terrific. Uh, so let me move on a little bit to vendors for a second. Okay, and I'm going to go to customers in a minute, um, which is obviously an important area. Um, oh, actually, let me let me I should I should have mentioned one other area when it comes to employees. Um, a lot of times uh, when you don't have a big formalized structure, right, and you're not signing an employment agreement with somebody, uh, you're just hiring them as an employee at will, but you have sensitive information inside of your company that employees are going to have access to or contractors are going to have access to. Uh, in addition to that, um, they may be doing things like technology for you, right? In which they're developing things, right? Um, there's an agreement it's called different things, but it's basically an, an intellectual property assignment agreement. And what that, that agreement basically says is while you're working here, um, you have to keep everything confidential and equally importantly, Anything you develop while you're here is owned by the company. Okay, so you're hired. You're hired as you know a, with an offer letter to do technology development. Um, now, without the independent, I'm sorry, without the, the intellectual property agreement, you can still make the argument that this is all the companies. But it's just, it's just much clearer. This is a very simple agreement. That says you're going to keep things confidential. You're going to everything you do while you're here is going to be owned by the company. There are similar provisions for an independent contractor, where in that independent contractor agreement, it will say everything that you do while you're an independent contractor is owned by the company. Okay, don't think that that um, means that if some independent contractor comes with their own product or service or things that they had before that it's owned by the company and there's usually some language that says, you know, anything that was developed from the time that they started till now um, is a uh, is owned by the company. Okay, super important if you're doing anything proprietary, doing anything in technology, um, or even if you have a, a certain sense of methods that you use. Um, another way to do it would be in your offer letter to say every employee is subject to the following uh, policy. And then you would have the policy somewhere in internal documentation or on an internal website that every employee would read and acknowledge that they've that they know that policy, okay? Um, one thing I wanna say about this um, is that, you know, and again, you're talking to an ex lawyer here. Um, <laughs> the legal stuff is important, but in a lot of ways, we always feel like it's not what stirs the drink, right? It, what stirs the drink is customers and employees. These are necessary evils, but don't get caught too much up in it. There are people like us and others and, and, and resources that I'm gonna to mention to you that can help you a lot in these areas. Okay, but I remember even when I was raising money for my first company, remember I was the type of lawyer that was involved in raising money and I used a friend of mine from law school to do the work and I finally, his name was David, I finally said, David, I don't wanna to talk to you about this stuff anymore, I wanna go run my business. Okay, so you have to do this stuff but you don't want it to weigh you down and so there are a lot of, there are a lot of resources which we're gonna talk about at the end that can, that can help you. That's great. Michael, we might have a couple of people in the waiting room, I think a couple of people got kicked out by accident. Um, and then I also wanted to, um, Abby, is there anything that um, Michael is talking that kind of is jotting, you know, your, <laughs> your thought in terms of what you're dealing with? Yeah, I mean, our system does a lot of contracting like this. So we help um, new businesses get themselves set up and legally sound and all that sort of thing. So yeah, definitely rings a bell for me. Okay, yeah. great. Um, and, and Abby, services like yours and others, and I'm going to share this in a little bit at the end, are making it easier and easier to do that. You know, sometimes there's human beings involved and sometimes 
you know, they ask you a series of questions and it will squirt out an operating agreement for you. Right. And that's fun. Sounds like that's stuff what you guys are doing and others are doing. I'm going to talk at the end of what are the different resources and and where you know when should you get them and where can you get them. Um, this is true also in a little bit in the accounting area. So we'll but we'll focus on the legal stuff here. Okay, Michael, uh, Mike, this, uh, Michael, this is Chris from San Diego. Can I just say hey, one super quick thing um, in the sort of employee versus ICs uh, decision? Uh, yep. If anybody hasn't um, already sort of navigated that or might be doing that again, it's also important to check out your, not only your state and county, but even local municipality yeah. laws. For instance, here in San Diego, which used to be sort of conservative or libertarian, it's uh, politically been changing the last handful of years. And now, depending on what type of employee benefit it is, um, even if you're, even if you have as few as five employees, you you now have to grant different types of sick leave, um, all sorts of family, all sorts of different things of that nature. Which, um, and now it's even moving into other sorts of benefits and and, and the threshold, but at which health benefits and such are required. Yeah. It, it's no longer full time employment; it's coming way down in terms of part time. So, um, so that's another thing people must consider. Uh, not being stingy, but just. You, am I going to be able to make the bottom line uh, when it comes down to when you assess all those costs? So that's something that we hired an HR consultant here locally. Uh, my wife did actually some time ago, um, just to get a little bit of that guidance, but it's changing by the day, literally. So that's another factor, particularly in a place like this, but maybe not so much elsewhere in mid-America. Yeah. Thank you for that, Chris. Um, like I said, this is not stuff you want to obsess and figure out on your own. Like Chris said, there's, there's, come to us, we'll guide you. There's other people out there that can guide you, especially in your state. And this is the type of thing where this is, you know, through a network of people that we have, you have, this is stuff, you know, sometimes basic advice you can get is free. Somebody can call you up and tell you exactly what Chris said and direct you appropriately. So I don't want to be nonchalant about how important it is. It is important, but we, you know, we also want to get on to, <laughs> to running our businesses, you know? Um, so thank you for that, Chris. Um, some, I know there's some new people. Vikas, um, where are you based? You're based in Minneapolis? Oh, Vikas, are you on mute? Yes, I'm here. Uh, yes, I am based in Minneapolis. And uh, Michael, what we have been doing is we have been working. My company's name is Virtue Analytics. And uh, we are building uh, tools, not only for students, but also for colleges and institutions. Mm -hmm. So it started a few years back where we wanted to bring in uh, some more transparency in the financial aid optimization piece. The current process of allocating financial aid to students mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. is pretty, uh, I would say, suboptimal and also pretty dated. 30 years back, still that ACT, GPA, 8 by 8 grade, and everybody falls within this bucket, get the same money. Uh, we wanted to bring in some more analytics into that yep. uh, framework, into that thinking process. Last year, uh, we switched whatever we were doing for the colleges for students because there are two sides of the coin, right? One is college, other is the yep. students. Yep. So we brought all that intelligence and everything uh, into a student framework, which is, uh, uh, you know, when you're buying a car, you can go compare prices, right, scholarships. Right, right. When you're buying a house, you can compare, right? There's nothing like that that exists for higher education because one, it's very complex. There's so many moving parts. So what we've started working on and we are piloting with several nonprofits right now is the student, their family can go in and can compare different, uh, what kind of scholarship they can get, what will be their out of net out of pocket cost uh, uh, across multiple universities. We have 500, 600 universities mapped right now. And also an ability to pick up the actual award letters because award letters are also very confusing bring it yep. in and then you can compare and right, we believe right decision that is being made at the point of before you actually start a college has financial uh, repercussions. Sorry, a long answer to your short question, but. Uh, no, no, I appreciate it. Are there, everything. what, you know, since we're talking about legal stuff, we'll put you on the spot. What, sure. what kind of legal issues and challenges have you been facing in forming that? Uh, you know, early stage, so I I can be within the, under the radar at this point in time, but I'm sure, you know, uh, moving on data, privacy, encryptions, uh, everything is going to be very important for us. Uh, the things that you shared about employees, you know, they have access to to the data, what will they do about it or, you know, yep. everything, employees here. Uh, so I do have some questions, but they're very specific, very personal. So 
I thought maybe some some other time, and I, that's the reason I didn't bring it up. But yes, we will be. Gotcha. Uh, gotcha. These are important for us. Terrific. And and no, listen, it's everybody has these issues, and we want to be able to, you know, there's, you know, even something as simple as is somebody an employee, as Chris said, is not so simple anymore, unfortunately. Um, and right, true. The value uh, is, you know, like you said, because is is the service you're providing, and you've got a legal framework that you've got to that you've got to deal with. So um, the other thing that I should mention in forming a company is very similar to Chris, your comment about some local things is more and more local jurisdictions are requiring, whether it be separate licenses, separate registrations, right? So you start, you know, you start a, a, a restaurant in Austin, Texas, you probably have to get a restaurant license in Austin, Texas. So don't think that that it's just limited to the type of company that you form and you're qualified to do business, you may have to, uh, you know, go to the local jurisdiction and figure out, you know, exactly what you need to do. Um, these are the types of things, just so you know, everybody, these are the types of things, you know, we really consider ourselves a one-stop shop. These are the things we're trying to continue to bring more and more into the learning community. So there's one place to go. Obviously there's millions of counties in the country. So, and throughout the world, so we can't have all of them, but we're, we're trying more and more to, to, to bring this stuff together. Um, okay, great. Um, so what I would say is, is, you know, you have your company stuff, you've got your kind of employee area um, and you've got, I want to go to the vendor area. Um, we hire vendors for all types of things, right? We hire vendors to build technology. We hire vendors to clean up our office. We hire, you know, you name it. We, we hire vendors. Um, and you're going to want to sign an agreement with vendors that will dictate the terms of your relationship. Um, and a couple of different things to keep in mind. Number one, uh, you want to try to keep the, um, the term of these agreements with vendors as flexible as you can keep them as an early stage company. Okay. There will be times in the future when you're bigger, where you want to have, you know, three-year agreements and you want to lock in a price for a service or a product and you want that and you want it for three years. In the beginning, a lot of times is what you're looking for is flexibility, right? I, I don't know exactly how the business is going to go. I don't want to commit to, I'm hiring a technology firm to build technology for me and I have to spend a whole bunch of money and I have to you know, do it for two years. So a lot of times you, you'll give up um, better prices for more flexibility to kind of get out when you, when you want to get out. Think about the number of people that under COVID had five-year leases and they signed those five-year leases because the lease term was good and then only to find themselves a year in and going to their landlord and saying, hey, listen, I'm in trouble. I can't pay the bills and they still have four years left on their lease. So it's not that easy, but um, in the early stages, sometimes it's worth giving up price for a little bit of flexibility on how you might be able to terminate an agreement with somebody. Okay? Because you know, we have, we have flux in our, in our early stage businesses. Um, next is, um, yes, as part of your vendor agreements, you could always have these confidentiality um, provisions and intellectual property protection if it's that type of vendor, um, you know, that everything's being done is being, um, uh, being done for, um, you know, for you and, and you're paying for it and therefore you own it, you know, all those different types of things. Sometimes in vendor agreements, they will also have a provision that prevents the vendor from hiring one of your employees. Okay. So not nearly that common if it's somebody that's, you know, cleaning your office, not really matters, but as you're doing, you know, because like you, more sophisticated things, right. There'll be a provision in there that will say, you know, you can't hire our employees. Okay. Um, I think probably more important than the legal side of vendor agreements are the structure, the best way that you can to tie the compensation of the vendor to results, okay? So I hire a social media firm. I'm gonna hire them for a couple months to do social media. Um, what are the very specific results that we are going to achieve? And if we do not achieve those results, you should be able to terminate the contract or there should be some other um, economic impact. Um, this is really important, right? Because there's a lot of people that come to the table and say, we can do something for you, right? But what you need is you need the best performance out of all your resources. And one of those is obviously your vendors. So um, 
defining your goals um, as part of the contract. Um, if you're going to hire a PR firm, um, say to the PR firm, I want to define the number of placements. How are you guys define that? And you could have one of one of a couple structures. One could be, if you don't hit those placements, I can terminate you at any time. Or you might tie compensation to it. You say, no, I, want, I know you want me to pay you $7,000 a month for PR, but that's not what I'm gonna do. I'm gonna pay you 4,000 a month. And if you hit our goal, I'll pay you seven. If you hit less than our goal, I'll pay you something less. If you hit more than our goal, I might pay you a little bit more. But try the best way you can to tie the compensation of the vendor to the, the actual results that you're, you wanna achieve. Now, a lot of people say, but wait a minute, it's so hard to define anything that's not measured is not managed, right? And so do the best you can, work collaboratively with the vendor. They don't have to be unreasonable. But the last thing you want somebody to say to you is, no, no, I know your social media account hasn't grown, but we've been working really hard at it. And your agreement doesn't allow you to, to change the dynamic of what, of what that relationship looks like. Okay, so those are the basics of vendor agreements. Keep them short, unless you're trying to lock something up. Make sure you have the proper protections and make sure the best way you can, you, you tie the, uh, the performance and, and the compensation, more, more importantly, of the vendor to, uh, to the result, the specifics results that you're trying to achieve. Okay, um, let me stop there for a second. Uh, any questions or comments? Michael, will you be also talking about, uh, because we do have, uh, so my company, we basically licensed uh, technology from a uh, stealth mode company. Mm -hmm. And we are expanding on that technology through our uh, innovative platforms. The, mm -hmm. the challenge there is um, what sits in their domain because they have patented the couple of things, but the additional application of those technology for additional field, for example, yep. uh, the medical device technology that kills all bacteria, but they were looking at more of a consumer space mm -hmm. rather than actually the medical space where I'm involved in surgical site infections. Yep. So as we are developing that, how do you segregate what is owned by my company versus what I have licensed from them and we have a MOU at the moment. We're going to go into a definitive agreement, uh, but what kind of things we need to keep in keep in that definitive agreement? Yeah, we used to deal with this a lot in a SaaS platform because um, we came to the table with a SaaS platform in my healthcare business, and then we customized it. Um, and you know, we had to write very specific language. I think in your particular case, now's the time to do it if you're at the MOU level, because especially when you're talking about medical device, bring in real investors, this is where you really need to draw the line, right? And a lot of way that these lines are drawn in your particular circumstances through license agreements. Yep. But they won't say you own it 100%, I own it 100%. We'll say we agree, let's say it's the company you're working with. We agree that we, you know, everybody agrees that we came to the table with some technology and you are going to take our technology, again, with our permission, and, and, and go and use it for a different application, right? Mm -hmm. So it wouldn't be so much you own this and I own that because you're using their technology, you're just applying it differently. That's who you would build in essentially a license agreement where as part of your overall economic relationship, they would agree that they're giving you a you know, perpetual, potentially worldwide license. And that is a function of the overall economic relationship. Yeah. yeah. Does that make sense? Yeah, absolutely. And and I think what we have carved out is the indications, medical applications and indications for those um, technology areas that we will own um, and they will have some kind of royalties, back-end royalties. Right. Commercials. right. Yeah. And, and I think it gets a little bit more complicated when it comes to who gets to patent what, right? And uh, you want to try to, especially if you know, you're negotiating with them and, and, and they're anxious to have you as a customer or a partner. Mm -hmm. This is where you try to weave all of that in um, yeah. to have the biggest, if you said, hey, listen, I'm giving you other strategies for commercializing this that, that you're not investing in, that we're gonna extend, that's gonna ultimately lead to more revenue for you. I need to have the flexibility to, to explore that without worrying about, you know, legal stuff. Yeah. Does that make sense? 
Yeah, it does. Uh, we have currently agreed in the MOU is we will have perpetuity, uh, you know, to their uh, patents, the existing ones. Yep. But my concern is as we move and my team, I'm growing my team, we will be building based on those few fundamental patents. Yeah. So who will own that IP considering that it still, you know, is stemming from that fundamental few patents. Yeah. So those, sometimes they're called different things, but those derivatives, which there's some sites called, you have to, you have to build those in, right? You have to basically say that we don't know yet, but we are going to build out other derivatives of this. Mm -hmm. and, and therefore um, the license that we're talking about here, they're not likely to say you own it. If you're putting your sprinkles on their ice cream cone, mm -hmm. it's, it's unlikely they're going to say you own the ice cream cone. Mm -hmm. um, but you should say, hey, listen, technology is evolving. We want to be able to apply these technologies to to different um, use cases. Um, and we're investing in this. We got to need to be able to do it freely to know that if we go and do this, that this license applies to um, derivatives of this. Now, they may say, OK, that's fine, but we're developing our own business when it comes to this particular market sector. So it doesn't apply to that sector. Mm -hmm. um, but but you should definitely define that now so you you have the ability to explore a little bit. Yeah, because they have not even explored certain medical field like Alzheimer's disease with this technology. Yep. And, and we have enough data from our other work that we've done in the past. Um, you know, when I was working in Alzheimer's disease, uh, that yeah. this technology could really uh, you know be the forefront runner of. A prevention of Alzheimer's, which is huge than actually even treatment, right? So yeah, especially 100%. And there's obviously the they just had the FDA approval of the first real Alzheimer's drug, you know, so obviously, there's a lot of work being done there. Yeah. So um, what happens in the situation when you're talking to your, you know, potential, you know, uh, where you're acquiring these licenses are, is they become a little bit greedy, because now they have seen something that they had never connected those two things. Yep. Uh, so, so I think that is where, uh, so I, I want to be uh, transparent, but at the same time, I'm holding back some of this information for the same reason. So, um, so I think to your point, what you said earlier is we are carving out uh, specific uh, applications of this technology in certain medical areas. So that way we are not, you know, conflicting with the areas that they're working on. Yeah, and listen, it's really, you know, I um, well, I learned a lot about this as a young guy doing M and A. Um, there's there's some very counterintuitive things. You would think if you showed up and said, "Hey, exciting news! Right. We've got a whole market segment that we think we can get you guys into," they would be like, "That's awesome!" And then next day, the license is more expensive, right? <laughs> <laughs> um, so yeah, you have to listen. I, I with good partners, of course, you want to try to be transparent, but at the same time especially in this arena, when we're talking about kind of medical technology, you know, there's, there's big boys and girls at the table. Yeah. So you do have to appropriately, there's always a, there's always a way when you ultimately get into an agreement together where you can, you can help and give back more and, and do more, but you do have to play it appropriately close to the vest to make sure that you're, that they're understanding the opportunity you're providing them. And at the same time, not overpricing it or creating terms that are, mm -hmm. uh, that are a problem. No, I would love to, uh have an offline chat with you. I don't want to take everybody's time on this call. Sure, sure. Um, yeah, you can, everybody knows like just the legal area, it goes from the very basic of, you know, Chris, right? Like what's an employee all the way to, um, all the way to this stuff, which is, you know, relatively complicated. Let me, our time always goes so fast and I, I, I wish we had more. Um, let me just kind of round out on resources, right? Let me give you kind of a framework of the way the industry works. There are, what I'm going to call kind of self-service stuff, right? The, the, the legal zooms and the, my corporations and, and Abby's products. It sounds like Abby, you know, correct me if I'm characterizing this wrong, give you great flexibility to a lot on your own, right? Yeah. They are yeah. usually very intuitive. They ask you questions. Even there's a couple of law firms out there like Cooley and stuff that will literally let you create documents on the fly. Now, I'm saying that having somebody went to a really cool law school, right? It's not that easy. Like, yeah, I'm just going to go online, answer some questions and boom, I got an agreement. So there are these self-service ser self -service services. What I would say for the basics, like forming a company, 
reach out to one of them. Of course, we're happy to help. Reach out to one of them. They'll walk you through the whole process. That's what they do. And they're starting to do more and more and more in the, in the basics area, okay? Um, when it comes to, uh, you know, kind of you're going to the next level up, um, obviously your people like Lonely Entrepreneur in the community, um, when we do our one-on-one -on -one coaching, uh, any startup consultant or coach that you're working with or you know should be guiding you to be able to give you basic legal agreements, right? I've got a contract for, with a vendor, independent contractor, all these agreements, we have these in the community. We can certainly direct everybody to the, the section in there. Uh, and we're doing a big expansion of that as well as all kinds of different types of, of legal agreements. Um, when it comes to going and hiring a, a, a startup lawyer or a lawyer in the early stages, you really want to work with somebody that is used to working with startups because this is not the kind of thing where you can just have hourly billing because it just adds up too quickly, right? You can strike relationships where you put somebody on retainer where these issues that we've talked about here, except for the last one we were talking about is are really basic. Anybody should be able to do them very efficiently. And so, um, you know, there's, there's these startup lawyers, the best, you know, granted, sometimes you'll get it done for free. And a lot of times you can get an advisor on your advisory board, who's a lawyer that can help you for the stuff and they'll do it for nothing. Um, startup lawyers, a lot of times the best arrangement is just say, I'm going to pay you $2,000 a month and you'll do all my legal stuff. And if it gets crazy, we'll figure it out. We'll figure it out later. But rarely should you be engaging with, you know, kind of hourly legal fees. Um, Cause it just, you know, it just, is too extensive. Um, the other thing that's emerging a little bit is kind of freebies. Like we are working right now at Lonely Entrepreneur with a bunch of law firms that are uh, about starting to offer free legal services to some startups. So we will make that available to all of you um, when that comes to bear. But there are more and more, especially for women and minority owned businesses, there are lots of networks where um, you know law firms are making uh, lawyers available for some of the basic um, legal issues that we that we've been talking about here and, and even some uh some more extensive ones okay um there is there's nothing magic about uh okay i get a, a sample agreement and i and i don't really know what that means right because it's a legal agreement and i never really let a legal agreement there are lots of people that can help we can help um there's friends that you know one of the great things about lawyers is that these issues are usually pretty easy for them so Getting somebody on your advisory board who, who can help you. Oftentimes, these are not consistent legal issues. Obviously, what you guess what you're doing, there's you know, more technology involved in some, and, and obviously with pool, there may be more. But um, I think for the most part, you know, try to find an advisor that's a lawyer um, that, that either you know or a contact knows that would be happy to give you a couple hours a month to try to guide you through, um, through the different issues that exist out there. Awesome. This has been great. Um, and I know we're coming up on our hour, so I wanted to leave a minute or two uh, in case anybody has any questions. Okay. Um, and just a quick thing, I um, we had dropped in a link to um, our survey. I know we're always trying to add value and um, get a sense of how we can improve. So if you haven't yet, please take a couple of minutes to just click on it and fill the survey out it would really help us. Um, and uh, we will be here again next Friday. Looking forward to seeing everybody back here. Thank you everybody for your time. Hope you have a great Friday and rest of your weekend. Thank you guys. Have a good weekend. Bye. Okay. Uh, Vipula, I just emailed you. So you should have um, uh, uh, the contact in your inbox. Thank you so much. Of course. Thanks, Michael. Nice meeting you. You as well. Thank you, everybody. Have a great weekend. Thanks, Vegas. Thank, thank you, everybody. All Very right. nice to meet you all. Bye-bye. Thanks. Bye.